Our lecture today is about the Fukushima and its reconstruction. As all of you know, like we had an earthquake in 2011, and we had a nuclear issue, and we just still, you know, continue with that. So uh, we would like to introduce Ryugo Hayano from the University of Tokyo. To introduce himself, Dr. Ryugo Hayano is a professor of experimental physics at the University of Tokyo. His research concerns include fundamental symmetries and interactions in nature using antimatter. In 2008, he received the Nishimura Memorial Prize, the most prestigious physics prize in Japan. Since March 2011, his tweets related to the Fukushima Daiichi accident attracted some 15,000, sorry, 150,000 followers. His activities in Fukushima include systematic measurement of school lunch for radio casism, study of international exposures using whole body counters, development of whole body counter for small children, and comparison of external radiation does of high school students living in Fukushima, outside of Fukushima, France, Poland, and uh, Belarus. So um, let us welcome Mr. Ryuho Hayano. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's a wonderful day outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity. <laughs> well, um, so uh, I'd like to uh, to discuss with you what what's been happening in Fukushima after five years. And uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Okay. <coughs> right. So um, I lost my clicker. So, um, so uh, five years ago, uh, on March 11th, there was a big earthquake. Well, there was still a, a, a bigger one recently in Japan. And uh, it, uh, it happened close to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which is about 250 kilometers from Tokyo. Okay. Oh, oh, it is about very good to the microphone. So, okay. Over the five years, this is the radiation level measured at Fukushima Daiichi and around Fukushima Daiichi. This extends to about 60 kilometers. From Fukushima Daiichi. This is 20, 30 kilometers. And this is the color coding. And as you can see, over the five years, the, the radiation level has decreased. And this is no, uh, mostly due to the decay, natural decay of the contamination, which is uh, mostly radioactive cesium, which has a half life of uh, two years. And another one is 30 years. Uh, and, and of course, there were some. Uh, uh, cont contribution from the from the uh, 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 decontamination efforts by the people. Well, let me use the other one. So as compared to the to the Chernobyl accident which happened which occurred in 1986, the area contaminated is much smaller. As you can see, it's, it's a lot smaller. But this is the same scale, length scale, distance scale, and the same contamination level scale scheme, which is scale which is indicated in, in this color. But the concern is that there are about two million people living close to Fukushima Daiichi. Now, this, the effect of the uh, the uh, the radiation to this uh, dense population was was a concern. There are two kinds of uh, effects which may affect people. One is called the external radio external exposure. The soil is contaminated by radioactive cesium, which decay by emitting the gamma rays, which hit you from outside. That's called the external exposure. The other is internal exposure. The food is contaminated and then you, you eat food and then
then you get irradiated from a brazier. This is called the internal exposure. Right. Well, important take, take, take home messages first. Well, obviously the Fukushima Daiichi accident was a very serious accident. In, in retrospect, it could have been uh, prevented. Uh, it, it, it was due to the poor design of the, of the site. Uh, however, no deaths due to acute radiation effect is reported, including the emergency workers at the site. And um, the, the World Health Organization, United Nations Science Committee for uh, regarding radiation, and uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, all these reports agree that discernible long-term health effects, including cancer increase, including thyroid cancer increases, are likely. So these are the important take-home messages. Okay. Well, in Japan, after the accident, uh, food restrictions, very strict food restrictions were imposed uh, on March 17th, just uh, within a week of the accident. And uh, after one year, uh, this became very strict, even more strict. It is called, this. remember this number, 100 becquerel per kilogram. That, that's the limit. As compared to the EU limit, do you know what, what the EU limit is? The EU limit is 1250 per kilogram. So the Japanese limits are very, very strict. And the other thing is that in Fukushima, only radioactive cesium needs to be monitored for uh, uh, protecting people because the strontium that was a big concern after the Chernobyl accident, and plutonium also after a Chernobyl accident. These are much less as compared to the cesium. This is 1,000 times less, and this is uh, 1 million times less. Well, this is what I do. I do physics, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the standard the CERN t-shirt. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the uh, the theory of the standard model of, uh, of, uh, of uh, elementary particles. And, uh, well, initially I, was, I didn't intend to become a, th a physicist. I was playing the violin. Yes, uh, was, right. <laughs> well, could you turn off the downlight here? These lights? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually, I was... Yeah, thank you. No. Maybe these. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah okay. So, well, I, I, in fact, I was very good. And uh, in 1964, I was uh, in Kansas, U.S. I was giving a uh, concert tour throughout the, the states. So for some time, as I was uh, struggling to decide whether I should uh, do music or something else. Uh, so uh, during my, my first high school days, that was my biggest uh, question. And, but then eventually I chose science. And then I teach in Tokyo when I, I have a lab in Geneva uh, where I have been leading a team of antimatter study since 1997. And um, so I, fly, I teach in Tokyo when I fly to Geneva every every uh, two weeks, or every month or so, and then uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years now. Well, speaking of CERN, CERN is now famous for the, the place where the Higgs spot was discovered, but uh, did you know that CERN is where the web was, was invented? Uh, just right before my office at CERN, there is this uh, a plate which is about this big, it shows where, it says where the web was born. So, um, the, the World Wide Web obviously had <coughs> a, a great social impact. You, and uh, you use, use this every day, right? But what about antimatter? That was my, my question. Um, well, I kept asking uh, myself the meaning of doing the useless research. Antimatter doesn't have any uh, direct uh, application and will not have uh, application for foreseeable future. So um, that was my question. Why am I doing this? This is useless. 
but that requires a very large amount of money. I, that's tax taxpayers' money. So uh, I always have to ask myself, and I also try to explain to people why I need this big money to do this uh, useful research, useless research. And then it happened. It was uh, March 2011. I was I was the, the department chairman, so my job was to make sure that everybody left the building safely. And this is this picture was taken. Uh, say uh, 15 or 20 minutes late after the, the earthquake, and it's the clock tower of the Tokyo University. And then I, 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 this, then I thought, how can I contribute yes, uh, I, um, to this uh, big uh, uh, disaster? And uh, I started to contribute to the society using my Twitter account. This is the famous uh, Rupert, and this is my first tweet. You don't understand this. This is in all in Japanese. 89 characters. This is March 12th, and uh, it roughly translates to this. It's, this is, I talked about the gamma ray emitted from the uh, from the cesium, which was detected at on the <coughs> campus of uh, Fukushima Daiichi. That was um, in the afternoon of March 12th. And uh, it uh, would require, uh, uh, would have required 180 characters, which, for, which exceeded the 140 character limit of, uh, of Twitter. So, um, as you can see, the Japanese tweets can contain more information, which made it very useful in terms of communication <laughs> to people after the accident. And I also, being trained as a physicist, when I looked at numbers, I have a tendency of making, turning that, those numbers into the graph of something visual. So this is my first visual tweet, which is March 13th. This is the graph of the year, uh, oh, no, sorry. This is the graph of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant front gate. There is a sharp rise of the radiation level in the morning of March 13th. Uh, okay. So this is my, my second tweet. And uh, after, so this is the number of my Twitter followers graph in the graph, and this is, this is uh, March 13, March 11, uh, 2011, but I had about 3,000 followers, which is a big number for scientists like me, but then it increased very sharply over to more than 150,000. And I still keep about 130,000 followers as of today. Uh, after about one year, Tohoku University researchers anal analyzed the traffic on the, on the internet and identified me as the seventh most influential uh, Twitter account in Japan following NHK, which is the TV station, and as a, he is a major newspaper in Japan. Okay. In 2014, October, the Science Magazine, that's the, the famous US Science Magazine, uh, listed top 100 scientists on Twitter. And uh, I was across all science disciplines and uh, lang uh, tweeting languages, and I was listed. I was found to be the 22nd worldwide. So the power of the social media is that it is, unlike the conventional media, it is bi-directional. Okay? So you get the feedback, and you can learn from people. So the first thing I learned from people when I, I thought that I should do something about was that mothers, in particular parents, started to work to be, become very very worried about, about the food safety, the content, possible contamination of food consumed by children. In, that was in the summer of 2011. Now this is the typical scene of a Japanese school lunch, six year old. And the question is, is what, what's this, if, if this was safe? So I proposed to measure, to mix everything served on the lunch tray and it in a blender and use a detector called the German detector to uh, quantify the amount of concentration of radioactivity in school lunch. I proposed this to, uh, to, uh, to the Ministry of Education and the person in charge said no. I understand why? Well, the person said no 
they didn't want to do this because if radioactivity was really found in Sumaichi, then, then that would spread panic throughout the country and, they, and therefore they didn't want to do this. That was a typical response in 2011. But then I, I approached the top, the minister, <coughs> I talked to the minister myself and then I, uh, I succeeded to convince the minister to fund this project and this uh, project started uh, from 2012. I show you a, a graph again. <laughs> uh, this is the, the result of the Fukushima City School lunch from 2012 to 2014. Even as I speak now, it, 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 the measurement is still going on. Remember this number 100 peclar <coughs> per kilogram? That's a limit imposed on all the food distributed in Japan from 2012. And uh, look at this, this scale. This is one peclar per kilogram. 100 peclar per kilogram is way up, and 1250, which is a U EU limit, is, is sky high, okay? And as you can see, there was no lunch which exceeded one peclar per kilogram in Fukushima. And, what's in, and it's very important for us and also to the, to the people, Fukushima people, uh, really, was, was that from uh, January 2013, Fukushima City started to serve local rice, the rice grown in Fukushima City at Fukushima School. And parents, PTAs and so on, uh, protested very strongly against this. Many people thought, uh, thought that this would be a very, very dangerous thing to do. But as you can see, the continuous measurements such as this show convincingly that there was no sign of the increase in radioactivity, even after they have switched to local works. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started to do this uh, lunch project, and the people started sending me donations. And so university, <coughs> our university uh, set up, this is in Japanese, uh, uh, Tokyo University founded, Foundation set up a web page. Uh, with, uh, with which uh, people can do send me donations. Well, the, the, the university takes 50% off <laughs> the top and then I, I get the 85%. But all the, 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 the activities that I'm going to discuss today are funded by, uh, through this funding and, uh, and supported by my uh, Twitter followers. So, but also because the, the, the social, the, the, the media, the Twitter and so on, connects people. I got connected to many people whom I didn't know before, after, after the, uh, the accident. And uh, for me, the most important was that I got connected to medical doctors in Fukushima who are struggling to establish you know, reliable, uh, radiation dose assessment and also uh, how to, uh, to protect people from radiation. And this picture was taken in the fall of 2011 at the Minamisoma City Hospital, which is just 23 kilometers north of Fukushima Daiichi. Up to 20 kilometer radius, uh, the government ordered people to evacuate. That was on March 12th. So nobody's Officially, nobody is living within 20 kilometers zone, even, even now. But this hospital was just three kilometers outside of that exclusion zone. So people, these, these medical doctors are struggling very much, very hard. So, let me uh, now discuss about the internal exposures. Of this. this is again the map showing the uh, soil contamination of Krishna. Uh, this was uh, measured using by flying airplane or helicopters all over Fukushima. This is up to 60 km, uh, 80 km radius. This is 20 km. And the people within this zone were ordered to evacuate. So people are not living here. So if you look at these places like Fukushima City, which is inhabited by 300,000 people, Again, Kodim City, which is again our, a lot, even slightly larger city. Uh, these are lies in this blue zone, which is 100,000 100, pecron per square meters. And uh, from the from the what we learned from the Chernobyl accident, 
there is some relation from the soil contamination, which <coughs> then contaminates food. And then that's uh, when you eat contaminated food, then you accumulate radioactivity in, in the body, and then you get uh, internal, internal uh, radiation exposure. So just by taking this uh, coefficient that we learned from Chernobyl accident, we estimated that people, these million, nearly one million people living in this zone, would be subject to about five millisievert per year, one year of uh, of uh, internal dose. Uh, this is about five times higher than the government goal of limiting this to one millisievert per year. So we started to measure uh, the people, and uh, so how how do we measure? Of course, we first measure food. Okay, so there were lots of food screening. Um, and still being done in Fukushima. And if this is really contaminated, then radioactive uh, re substances accumulate, start to accumulate in the body, and they decay from within the body by emitting gamma rays, which can penetrate your body and reach a detector like this. This is called the whole body counter, and typically you stand for two minutes in this device. This is heavily shielded by four, four tons of uh, iron, and there are <coughs> two detectors within this iron box. Okay. So, in 2012, in 2011 and 2012, I measured in collaboration with the medical doctors in Fukushima about 30,000 people. And uh, surprisingly, more than nine, about 99% of people were support and the non-detection. We couldn't see any sign of radioactivity in, the, in people's body. And this was true for 100% of children. This was somewhat surprising, which we wrote, uh, reported in this, in this uh, paper. And this, in fact, is, was much, much lower than what it was in 1964 mm -hmm. in Japan. In 1964, typically people had this level about nearly 600 peclel of cesium uh, in the body as a result of the global fallout. That's the atmospheric atomic bomb and hydrogen bomb test done by superpowers. And the device that we used in 2012, the detection limit was around here. We could, we could say for sure if people had cesium if that level was above this level. But if it, if it was below, then uh, we, we, we reported that this is empty. So this, uh, this was the limit. And um, nine, as, we, as I said, 99% was below this level, which means that the amount of radioactivity was much less than what it was in 1964. This is when Tokyo hosted the first Olympic game. You may ask why so long. Well, um, one of the reasons is that the rice, which is the staple food in Japan, is not contaminated. This was con confirmed by using a device like this. Well, this was installed throughout Fukushima in 2012, during the, spring, during the winter uh, during, uh, in 2012. Each rice bag contains 30 kilograms of rice. And uh, 10 million rice, such rice bags are harvested every year. So from 2012, local Fukushima local government have started to, uh, to measure every rice bag like this one using a device like this. And the results were rather surprising. Maybe surprise will surprise you. In 2012, out of 10 million, more than 10 million rice bags, the number of rice bags which exceeded 100 per kilogram, which is still very, very strict limit, was only 71. In 2013, this dropped 
to 28. In 2014, they were just two. Last year, it was zero. So, what you eat every day, what people eat in, in Fukushima every day, is not contaminated. A little bit, a bit of scientific background. Why is this possible when the, 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 the paddy field is contaminated? This is a graph showing the cesium harvested in, in Fukushima, and it shows the, uh, the cesium in brown rice background by kilogram, versus this is potassium in soil. This is ordinary, non-radioactive potassium in soil. As you can see, there is a very clear inverse relation. This was found already in 2011, or even before. People knew about this. Uh, the researchers knew about this. Why? Remember this? Have you seen this? Period of periodic table? Do you still remember this? Yeah. Okay. There is potassium. Well, potassium is an essential element for all the living forms to, uh, to function. And especially for plants. So, the plants try to collect potassium from, from soil because this is uh, essentially needed. Cesium sits here. So chemically, cesium and potassium are very similar. So if the ratio between potassium and cesium is high, is similar, then when plants try to collect potassium, by accident it also collects cesium. So the important thing is to change the, this ratio. Okay. That is more potassium than, than cesium. The cesium is there, but by applying potassium by, by potassium fertilizer, then you can reduce the, per, the, uh, the chance of, of uh, for instance, the rice collecting accidentally the cesium. And this worked very, very well. And this was instructed to farmers, all the farmers in Fukushima during the winter of 2011. And as you can see, as, as I just sh showed, the, the, the rice harvested in Fukushima in 2012 was uh, particularly cesium free. Um, yeah. Yes, so just to make, make it clear, so farmers, farmers put potassium yes. into the ground? Yes. The yeah. Yeah. Right. This is fish. Okay. So you've heard about uh, this uh, Tepco company is still leaking uh, contaminated water, and is uh, the, the, the 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 Pacific Ocean is contaminated. That is true uh, uh, to some extent. But if you measure fish, the result is rather surprising. Look at this green curve. This is from 2011, April to June 2011, up to uh, January, February 2016. Right after the accident, more than 50% of the fish that was caught off the coast of Fukushima Daiichi had radioactive cesium more than 100 per kilogram. Some of them were very, very high. Um, a few thousand, a few hundred thousand of per kilogram. But as you can see, recently it is nearly zero. Zero, zero, zero percent, zero point one or zero point zero percent. And it is believed that this will never go up again. Well, unlike the case of, uh, of, of rice, this was, uh, this was automatic. The people didn't do anything about it. Uh, there were no countermeasures. It so happened. Well, there are still uh, some, there are occasional, this is too, two out of 2,000, 
very few fish which is fishes which are, have uh, radioactivity. But it is now known that those were, are more than five years old. People could, well, there's a little uh, bone inside the ear of the fish, and you take out this and you count the, the stripes. And then you can, you can, you can uh, estimate the, the, the age of the fish. And this, is, this was done. And all these fish, fishes which, are, uh, which have radioactivity, are known to be alive when, must have been alive when, when the accident happened. So they, they are, are um, inhaled, in, in, <laughs> ingested. A huge amount of radioactive cesium, uh, but there is a, a, a time constant which is called the biological half life. So the, the, this radioactivity doesn't stay in the body of a fish or like in the human body. It's, it's released in urine and so on over time. But if the initial amount was very large, then you, you, you still uh, can find the fish which is in the five but as you can see, the fish radioactivity is recovering uh, over five years. So, entire exposure is negligible, I can say for this for sure, and food is safe enough. However, parents are still unconvinced. Okay. So I made a device called a baby scan. Remember the device that I showed before, you have to stand for two minutes. Babies cannot stand. And parents come and ask us, why don't you measure our kid, our baby? And uh, that was, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, was the most frequently asked question in 2012. So I decided to make a device uh, in 2013. So this again, is uh, six tons of iron shielded, and over here there are so four uh, devices, uh, four detectors to uh, detect the gamma rays emitted from the baby's body, and the baby lies on this bed. Okay. So, uh, as a measurement device, this is a complete device. You can you can do the measurement very very precisely. But, but you wouldn't put a baby in this device. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is the right? Yeah. Yeah. right. So I made this. So this is what we made. So inside there are the six tons of iron. There's a height adjusted bed, and the mother comes with the baby. Right? <laughs> and put the baby on the bed. <laughs> And mother can watch the baby, and in four minutes the measurements are done. Okay. <coughs> so in, the first unit was completed in 2014, and we started measurement in December 2013. 2013 rather, and throughout 2014 we measured more than 3,000, uh, more than uh, nearly 3,000 babies. <coughs> And uh, as of today, we measured more than more than five thousand babies. And uh, surpri surprisingly, again, we didn't find any baby who had uh, who had radioactivity. Mm -hmm. So uh, we now have three units. This is Fukushima, and this is Fukushima Daiichi. Tokyo it is around here. And there are three units: one here, one here, one here, surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi. And these red dots are the, 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 where the babies came from. So they, come, uh, they were measured here. They, live, they are living outside of Fukushima because they evacuated from Fukushima. They used to be living in here. And these are these people are living are, are close to uh, 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 these people. This is Columbia City. Uh, these were, these people were measured. Babies were measured at. This, uh, this hospital and these rules were measured at Tokyo, this uh, UIT city hospital. 
In the next slide, I will compare the Minamiso of my city, which is this the red people, and we have power, which is these people. Okay. Well, of these seven, uh, 3 thousand babies, nobody had detected red blue obsession. But that's not the end of the story. We asked the parents to fill out a questionnaire before taking the, the scan. We went and we asked them about their concerns, their food, their, uh, what they're eating, what they're drinking, and so on. And this is what we found. In Minamisova city, which is this place, and also including also these people, um, the, the, the size of the area of this uh, of these circles are drawn proportional to the number of people. Okay. This many people said they never drink <coughs> water. Tap drinking tap water they, they consider to be so dangerous. And this many people said they would never eat Fukushima rice. And these people said they, they would never eat Fukushima vegetables. In fact, 60%, nearly 60% said they would avoid everything. In Mihar town, to, uh, which is way to the west of Fukushima Daiji, this percentage was just four. They seem to be having uh, a nearly normal, uh, like before the accident, life. They drink you know, tap water, they, uh, they eat local rice. Some of, many of them, them are farmers and they eat also vegetables. These differences do not reflect in the, the, in the, in the radioactivity found in the, in the babies. Babies are clean anyway. But there is a huge difference in risk perception in Minamisoma and Mihara. Well, this is something beyond my scope. I know, I, I know some, uh, I, I think I know some answers, but I'm not an expert to answer this, this question. So, what's important is that this baby scan is a wonderful device for attracting families who have worries. They come, so the medical doctors at the, the hospital spend typically 20 minutes listening and uh, dis discussing the daily issues uh, with, with the families. So uh, we cannot take very many uh, families. We uh, take typically uh, five, ten families a day. Okay. But this communication is the most important part of our measurement. So I, initially I said there are two, two pathways. One is external and one the other is in, internal. But what about the external exposure? Already in the winter of two, in, from in the fall to winter of 2011, many municipalities in Fukushima started to, to distribute the personal dosimeters uh, to, uh, to, uh, to school children and to pregnant women. And again, the government goal, eventual goal, is to, uh, to reduce the, uh, the dose uh, due to the, the radioactivity dispersed by the accident below one millisievert per year. So this is one millisievert per year. So this is the distribution based on the uh, on the measurements done by, by Fukushima City and many other municipalities in Fukushima in the winter of 2011, typically uh, uh, December to November. Uh, December uh, uh, from October to uh, to December 2011. Uh, the scale is from zero to ten millisieverts per year, and again, as I said, this is one millisievert per year, which is the long-term goal. Already in the winter of 2011, the external exposures were not particularly high. There was nobody who was sick at ten millisieverts per year. And already in this year, about 50% were below one millisiever per year. <coughs> and for instance, in Fukushima City, this 50% number uh, increased to 
not 98% last year. So external exposures are, in fact, lower than what most people think. Most people, including the Fukushima people, are people living in Fukushima. And in fact, this external exposure is slightly higher than internal exposures because internal exposure is nearly, nearly zero. Well, the device called the glass patch, that's the person dosimeter, is distributed and uh, you uh, put on your body for typically for three months. And then after three months, you return this and then the, this, this is read out, analyzed, and you get a, a report on which you, see, you just see one number. Your three month dose was such and such BC. Well, this is not, not so much useful for communication. It is, uh, you cannot talk for 20 minutes, for instance, for instance discussing about external exposure risks based on just one number. That, that, that is so difficult. Well, I'm now going to tell you about the D shuttle, which I introduced. I didn't develop this, but I introduced this into Fukushima in 2013. This is an electronic device, and this can record your dose, your dose every hour, and then with a timestamp, your dose is locked into the memory, and later on you can read out the result and make graphs and so on using a computer. Well, in the summer of 2015, students from France came to Fukushima with this. I want to show you the result. Eight students and four teachers came from Paris to Tokyo and to Fukushima. You see many lines and the overlay of 12 dosimeters went out every hour, okay? This is Paris. And then, if you look closer, there's a peak. What is this? Charles de Gaulle Airport. <laughs> so, people were, were hanging this dosimeter like your name tag, and you had to take, take that, and then this went through the security x-ray. So this is x this so uh, the dosimeter was x-rayed here. <laughs> yeah. So this was, this is during the flight. Of course this is the uh, cosmic rays hit you continuously during the flight. And in Tokyo we all got invited to the French Embassy again this is security screen. If you look very, very closely, there were two students who smuggled <laughs> into the, into the uh, embassy without uh, the screen. And they just we can, we can tell. The next day, we all got on the bus and drove along the, the coastline of, of the Pacific and went to Fukushima. And, this is, and then there is this peak higher than other places. This is Tomioka. This is one, 10 kilometer within, uh, 10 kilometers south of Fukushima Daiichi. Still, people are not allowed to live here, but you can get on, get, 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 you can get in to this town during the daytime. We went there because students wanted to see the debris of tsunami. And Tomioka station, there, there was a station, that was completely washed out by the tsunami. And we, so we went to, 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 uh, to Tomioka Station. And uh, so these houses, well, the station is on your side. Okay? So the, the students are walk, look, looking towards the station and towards the Pacific. You can see the houses, what used to be the a house, and, uh, the damaged houses and so on. And as you can see, the, each person has, uh, has a, a name tag and also the, the, the dosimeter from hanging from the, from the, from the neck. 
So this is uh, when this, it was high. On the last day, we went to Kunimi, which is famous for peaches. So we uh, enjoyed eating peaches, and of course we uh, picked several peaches and went back to to Fukushima High School and measured the peaches and and, and, uh, and confirmed that the peaches that we ate during the daytime didn't actually didn't have uh, radioactivity. So as you can see. This was measured using the same dosimeter carried by the same person over these days. And except for this place, which is within the, 10, within the 20 kilometer exclusion zone, there's not much difference. Paris, Tokyo, Fukushima. So the dish of all, as you can see, is a very it is a powerful device. And Fukushima students, high school students, <coughs> were motivated to better understand their situation using this device. So we conducted measurements and a comparison of individual pers the personal dose of high school students and wrote a scientific paper together. Let me show you. So already our study started one year earlier, in the summer of 2014, our Japanese co-authors <coughs> came to Fukushima Divide students from all over Japan. And uh, these are the high school students analyzing data. And we sent those dosimeters to Europe. Yes. And they, they came back uh, in December 2015. And these were analyzed. So this is the first two pages of the paper. There are 233 names and the co-authors, most of them high school students from, uh, from Japan, France, Poland, and Belarus. This paper was downloaded. Uh, it's been five months since we uh, published this paper. It's been downloaded more than six, 60,000 times. Very well read paper. So six participating schools in Fukushima, one, two, three, four, five, six and six other schools in Japan, and France, and Belarus. This is Chernobyl. This here, yeah. Close to Chernobyl. And Poland. And as you can see, this is the estimated annual dose. Actual measurement was done for two, two weeks. But we estimated annual dose. This is what we receive per year. Inside of Fukushima, outside of Fukushima. In fact, the highest external exposure due to natural radiation was found in Bastille, France, that's on Corsica Island, due to the granite, uh, the radiation from granite. So the measurement worked. Uh, despite the confusions, the measurement worked. Internal exposures actually very low. I, I would say negligibly low. External exposure not much different from other parts of Japan or other countries. But the communication, when it, to communicate, this radiation is a very complex subject. To to fully and to to, to communicate this, very inefficient. But it's it's important to do a face to face communication and listen to people. And other issues, evacuation is an issue. As I said, people within 20 kilometers zone were evacuated already on, on the second day. About 100,000 people had to leave. And even as of today, so as of today, the people, about 60,000 people who used to live in this, in this zone are still unable to return. Why took so, took, took so long, even though the radiation level in many of these areas are low enough? That's something that we have to understand. Other issues, spiral dose. Well, if you Google the keyword Fukushima or Tenko, this is the timeline, 2011, 2015, there was a peak. And, and recurring peaks 
later on, and the Curies mostly come from German-speaking countries. In Japan, the Fukushima Daiichi internal exposure and external exposure, you look at external and internal. This is the internal exposure. As you can see, the internal exposure, people have more fear, uh, fear more about the internal exposure against the internal, uh, external exposure. Something very different. All these, all these had a decrease in trend. But what didn't, what's not decreasing is the thyroid cancer. Because there are thyroid cancer patients that being found in Fukushima. And most of the curies come from Fukushima prefecture. So this is something that we uh, still have to, uh, to, uh, to do something about. Even though the thyroid dose, actually thyroid dose in Fukushima is known to be very low as compared to the case of Chelwin acting. And then uh, the age distribution in the case of Chelwin looks like this. And in the case of Fukushima now looks like this. So many experts believe that the uh, thyroid cancer is being found so far have nothing to do with the year uh, with the Fukushima Daiichi accident, but uh, there are people who do, do not believe this, and many uh, parents are still worried. So, conclusions. Radiation risks are low, the risks are low in Fukushima. Uh, still, people still live with doubts and fear in Fukushima, indicating fear, fear the failure of risk communication in the Indonesian interface. The face-to-face Communication is very, very important. And uh, importance of active person participation, as we did, of young generation is very important. Lessons that trust is easy to lose, difficult to regain. And measurements are very, very important. Essential, but quantitative argument is very, very difficult. The thyroid problem and evacuation problem still exist. And what I didn't say, but the compensation scheme, designing a compensation scheme is even more difficult. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayano. Um, we can take several questions, so if you have any, so um, can we start first? Hi, I'm George Dark from the UK Delegation. Um, thanks for the really, uh, really great talk. And I find it especially interesting looking at the risk perception. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I know you must get this question a lot, but why, why do people perceive the risk of radiation to be much higher than not being produced when driving your car during the day is mm -hmm. a much more risky endeavor than uh, often so seeing in these big areas? Well, radiation is invisible. You, you cannot, you cannot uh, taste, you cannot see, and uh, the, the units that, that people use, Becquerel, Seabelt, people don't know about these. It is very difficult to communicate. And, uh, um, uh, well, people usually don't know about the natural radiation background. People are subject to about two millisieverts per year of natural background, and also in many countries, the medical exposure is even higher. In Japan, it is about four. In total, in Japan, it's about six millisieverts per year. But people don't know about this. So maybe in in UK, the, your communication seems to work better. I mean, I was very surprised that after Fukushima, the public acceptance. Of, uh, of nuclear power increased in the UK. Do you know? Did you know this? No, no, it was a, yeah, it, it did. It was a very surprised. It was very surprised. But it is usually it's very difficult to communicate to people about this invisible risk. Uh, well, I could maybe uh, I. Let me take another question. This is a very difficult one. <laughs> okay. You go first and then go. Okay, so it's kind of related to what you just said because um, I come from Poland. I'm representing the Chile delegation. And you know, even though I was born quite a couple of years after Chernobyl, mm -hmm. the collective memory of the collective trauma of Chernobyl is very much good. And that has, over the years, inhibited any 
let's say, investment in nuclear power, which is why we rely on coal. Mm. So nuclear power is very dirty technology, yes. it's not as clean as nuclear technology is, and you can argue about it, but it's just that the trauma really inhibits people to support, mm. support for, for power plants. So how has it been for Japan? Like, well, Japan had a huge plan in that. So even before the Fukushima Daiichi accident, there was a certain fraction of people, I would say a large, large fraction of people, who are, are who felt uh, uneasy about the nuclear anything. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and of course, this, uh, this act has made it even, even more difficult for, for utility companies to continue uh, the nuclear power, even though the government is now trying to uh, try to allow the utility companies to restart the, uh, the nuclear power plant, which there were used to be 58 active nuclear power plants, and now there are only two running. And, and the government is trying to allow other nuclear power plants to, uh, to reactivate. But there are strong uh, oppositions for restarting the nuclear power. We have survived without the nuclear power for five years. Why do, why do we need to restart? That's the, the, the basic argument. Okay, um, we take final question from the... Um... <laughs> well, let's, let's take two. Okay, short, yeah. short, 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 short points. Um, my name is Marco uh, from Italy, and I have a question about nuclear fusion. When do you think we'll be able to... Um... The, answer, the answer is simple. Always 50 years yeah. from now. <laughs> <laughs> that has been over the, five, over the past 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question will be, like the thyroid uh, measure, so why doesn't it include it in the external exposure? I mean, I have Well, the, the thyroid cancer is caused, known to be caused mostly by inhaling iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days. Iodine accumulate, it gets accumulated in, in, the, in, in thyroid. And uh, it is uh, mostly due to contaminated milk, which causes the, the large number of thyroid cancer in after Chernobyl. So it, the iodine once that you want disappear um, after about two, two months. Yeah. Okay, you have to really quickly find time. Francis from the United States. I'm really curious about the B scanner. How close are we to kind of commercial wearable technology like that for consumer cases? So like <clears throat> Apple watches, iWatches, mm -hmm. and measuring those pieces. I walk through my top hair almost every day of my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious about what that's doing to my body. So how how far away are we or where are we at by kind of looking at it, adopting it for everyone? Uh, well the technology is almost there. The demand is isn't <laughs> yeah. it's rising. So Apple watch, watches yeah, yeah. are coming now, like measure the sleep. Well, the sensor itself is about this, this big. It's about this big. So it will fit maybe in the whole line. Yeah, in the whole line. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hayano. I myself went to Fukushima Prefecture um, last July um, in a company, as part of my company's training. And there, you know, I went to an area which is prohibited to enter because of the nuclear radiation. And there, the situation was totally the same as four years ago. I mean, how some houses are, you know, floated because of the tsunami. And um, also, there's a bicycle, which a lot of junior high school students, you know, take, and then from the station, they take, you know, train to go to, go to school. And this, I mean, and at the station, a lot of um, bicycles are there, which means that they die when they're about to take train, and tsunami came. So the tr all this, you know, bicycles they take is over there. It, it was about, like four, four years has passed, so, you know, most of them are getting older and older, and a lot of dust are putting there. And then the houses are blank, nobody was there. And then, for example, on the first floor, because of the tsunami, um, only like, you know, trees are there, and then nothing was on the first floor. Only the structure part of the house was there. And I thought, um, not just a radiation problem, we have a lot of work to do. And a lot of people are still evacuating from Fukushima Prefecture, and one of the challenges 
are to how to get them back or how to create a new community within this region. So um, if you get, I hope like, um, you know, thanks to Mr. Hayano's lecture, you, you get a little bit of understanding for the problem of Fukushima. So if you could uh, search a little bit more of that, that would be really appreciated. And I hope all of you will, you know, all of you take the lessons that Mr. Hayano um, you know, um, said to you. So again, please give a big applause to... Um, <laughs>
So again, please give a big applause to Dr. Hayano and Mr.